Tonight, Amazon is telling customers to buy elsewhere. Alibaba's online store wants to take on Amazon and eBay, and the FAA approves the first commercial drone. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 106 for Wednesday, June 11th, 2014. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into the tech feed. So we've been following Amazon's standoff with book publisher Hachette and publisher Bonnier in Germany over ebook terms. Now it appears that since mid-May, the standoff has been spreading to movies, with Amazon refusing to take advance orders and delaying shipments on upcoming Warner Home Video features, including popular titles like, well, the wildly popular Lego movie, Winter's Tale, and Transcendence. Amazon's page for the movie says that the customer's only option is to sign up to be notified when they become available. The company previously issued a statement regarding the dispute with Hachette when it came to light, saying that these disputes are routine and anybody who really wanted the books immediately should go to a competitor. What Amazon doesn't seem to be doing with Warner is imposing those shipping delays on DVDs as they did with the books once they go on sale. Meanwhile, that Amazon music streaming service that's been rumored for a few months may launch as early as this week, according to several anonymous sources speaking to the New York Times. The new feature is said to give subscribers of Amazon's Prime service access to thousands of songs for free and without interruptions from advertising, but not including very, very new releases and not including the catalog of Universal Music Group, which is the world's largest, largest rather, music company. Ahead of its U.S. IPO, Alibaba Group officially launched 11 Main today, which is an online retail site for goods and crafts for local American businesses that gives Alibaba a window into the U.S. market. Offerings include fixed gear bicycles and women's jewelry. Almost kind of sounds a little Etsy-like. The marketplace features vendors and boutiques that are meant to provide as close to an online representation of an average U.S. town's Main Street as possible. Alibaba also announced that it will fully acquire mobile browser firm UC Web in the biggest merger in Chinese internet history and gives it more of an edge with competitors Tencent and Baidu. Alibaba previously owned two-thirds of UC Web. Tencent is currently China's biggest inter listed internet firm and owns mobile messaging app WeChat, which is ubiquitous. It's very, very large, which Alibaba executives have described as a monopoly. Alibaba said in a blog post, this integration will create the biggest merger in the history of China's internet and added that it'll be larger than Baidu's 1.9 billion acquisition of 91 Wireless, which happened last year. Reuters estimates that this would value the deal at more than $630 million. The Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA, has eased restrictions on commercial drone use in the U.S. and has given permission for a commercial drone to fly over land. The approval went to drone maker Aerovironment. That's a kind of a great name for that. And BP Energy Corporation, who can fly unmanned Puma aircrafts over Prudhoe Bay in Alaska, which is the home to the largest oil field in North America, to survey pipelines and roads and equipment for BP. Last week, the FAA said that it might allow some movie and TV studios to also commandeer unmanned aircrafts throughout the skies of the nation. The FAA has given permission for unmanned commercial aircraft flights over Arctic waters in the past. But today's announcement is the first approval for overland flights. Coming up, how close are we from the singularity? Mm, well, I have a guess. Did you read a lot of pre r releases over the weekend? Did a chatbot really get mistaken for a human? We're going to get to the truth. But first, I am joined by Dan Shu, so editor in chief at Games Beat. Hey, Dan. Hey, how are you? Good, thanks. Well, I know you're live at E3 on the convention floor. You're on a 3G connection, so kudos to you yeah. for making it happen. Good to have you. Uh, we've heard announcements from Microsoft and Sony and Nintendo, and we hear about lots of titles that are coming out, some not until you know a year from now, maybe even more. So what's the vibe today on the floor after all the, all the big announcements have been made? 
I think generally speaking, uh, the hardcore gamers are pretty pleased with this E3. You know, of course, you always have some jaded people who are tired of seeing a new Call of Duty, uh, some of the same franchises that pop up year after year and so on. But generally speaking, like the big three, Nintendo, PlayStation, uh, Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft, they're all really catering to the hardcore gamers this year. They want to attract the early adopters. They want them to get to buy the systems. And they're sort of, you almost get the sense that they're going to try to get after the mainstream people a little bit later. Uh, Microsoft, when they first started, they were going after the mainstream crowd by talking about its TV integration with the Xbox One. But they sort of backed off of that and just said, you know what, this E3 is just going to be about the games. So showgoers are checking out the games on the floor. It's it's it's, it's kind of a, a big convention at this point. And I know all, all of my gamer friends are, this is actually the part of the show that they like the most because they you get to talk to vendors and find out a little bit more about who's working on what. What is it like being on the floor besides exhausting? Yeah, well, you, you that's the first thing that comes <laughs> to mind, right? It's a, it's a tiring, uh, huge, it's like a mass of people you're fighting through. Uh, you know, I'm lucky to find this little quiet spot so we could do this interview. But, uh, you know, you can see if you're at some, some of the pictures, you can see so many people there waiting in line to play games. And the bigger the uh, name of the game, the bigger the line. So, uh, you know, but it's, it, you're right. This is the uh, when the show actually starts after the press conferences are over. This is when you get to go play the things that you just heard about and everyone's excited because you know I'm, I'm the same way i'm very happy to just get 15 minutes with a new game and then you kind of get bummed out because you know all right well this product isn't going to be released for several more months possibly more than a year so this is just your chance to get in that 10 15 minutes of play time uh, while you can you obviously cover games for game speed and i know that there's been a trend especially with something like the Xbox or the PlayStation where it, there's been a shift from, oh, it's just a gaming console, a gaming device, to it's a content device. And do you find that there is some backlash to that at a, at a show like E3, which has always historically been about games for the hardcore gamer? Well, it, it's a very good question because uh, if, if you take a look at X, Microsoft and how they un unveiled the Xbox One versus how Sony unveiled the PlayStation 4, they're very direct competitors. But when Microsoft first came out and started talking about their new system, they were really all about, hey, this is an all-in-one sort of entertainment system, uh, which is an odd tactic because Sony tried doing that with the PlayStation 3 last generation, and it did not work well for them. You know, like, uh, and it, it's, so it's, it's funny that uh, Microsoft didn't learn any lessons from what Sony did wrong. Well, we may have reached the end of our 3G karma from the floor at E3. That, of course, was Dan Sue, who is uh, the games editor over at Game Beat. I think we got the drift, though. By the way, uh, E3 officially wraps up about 24 hours from now at 4 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow. That's Thursday at the uh, convention center in Los Angeles. All right, finally, let's move on to that whole singularity thing, right? If a computer is mistaken for a human more than 30% of the time during a series of five-minute keyboard conversations, it passes what's known as a Turing test. Now, over the weekend, a press release from the University of Reading started kind of this chain of press around the tech world about how a chatbot had passed this Turing test for the first time. Lots of publication passed along the story, talked about what a big deal it was. You might have read it. Uh, the, 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 the background is Eugene. That's the name of this computer program. It simulates a 13-year-old boy. It was developed in St. Petersburg, Russia. The development team included Eugene's creator, Vladimir Veselov, who was born in Russia, now lives in the U.S. Ukrainian-born Eugene Demchenko, who now lives in Russia. This is all fine and good. The story simply is not real. And in fact, the guy behind it is kind of known for these sorts of hoaxes, so... Tech Press, what are you going to do? Better luck next time, computers. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2, you know, if you like it. And write us at TN2 at twit.tv. That's TN and the number two. And don't miss Tech News Today. That'll be tomorrow and Friday and the next Monday and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.